Hey everybody, it's Joy Brooks with Email and Coffee and another Friday. Today I'm really excited to talk with Nancy Zare. Nancy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Joy. Hi, I'm excited too. Uh, Nancy Zare, I hold a PhD from Boston College and I am a student of, of human behavior. Love to know how people behave and how they get along. Uh, my background includes uh, social work of various sorts. Uh, you're, I'm, at some point, I'm sure Joy's going to be asking how I got into selling because I'll be candid with you. I had a no new interest in sales when I was growing up. Um, and uh, if you're a bit like me, you kind of think sales is, eh, you know what I mean, a little sleazy, a little bit not, not exactly for a professional person. So at some point, I'm going to share with you how that came to be. And, uh, and yet, I've published a number of books. My latest book, which is No Pressure Selling, 15 Proven Formulas for Increasing Sales, Getting More Clients. This book, uh, as well as the others, are, are available, by the way, on Amazon. But I, uh, I wrote that book because I do take a very different approach to selling than that, that typical sense of push and drive and get it done and, you know, twist the arm and nah, that's not me. Easy. No pressure selling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, selling is, um, as an email marketer, um, I can talk about email marketing until I'm blue in the face and the person next to me is asleep. Um, and I could keep on talking about it. And I'm not selling. It's passion. But when it comes to selling a product that's in the email for the client, I, I'm like, oh, you want me to write some content? So, uh, you want a sales con uh, promotion? Oh. And I'm all of a sudden stuck. And it's difficult. It's very difficult for me. Um, not that I don't do it, but it's difficult. It's a completely different um, thought. And, you know, we as email marketers, we always say the email is for the customer. So you're supposed to be thinking like the customer. And that brings us to different personalities of the customer. And when you're talking with people more than, you know, let's get away from email for a second. When you're talking with somebody and you're trying to either get them interested, um, do what you're, you want to do, um, you know, <laughs> sell, get a job, you know, whatever it is, get a new friend. Um, sometimes we're like unconsciously moving forward and we're not reading anything. We're not reading the room. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the thing to do. Reading the room is pretty important. How do you get yourself into reading the room? Like, shut up and read the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, the room could consist of a single individual or maybe a couple, or it could be a small group or maybe a larger group. Uh, and reading the room, of course, is going to vary a little bit depending upon the size of the audience to whom you're speaking. But uh, let's start off with just talking to one person at a time, because I think that's the majority of the time, that's what's happening, right? We're just talking to one individual. And uh, what you're alluding to, Joy, is the fact that there are four personality styles. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with DISC or Myers-Briggs, there's colors, animals, birds, dogs, words. There are many ways to describe these four styles. I happen to have chosen my own schema. Uh, it, you know, that's, that's what I'm about. And I use numbers. And the reason for my using numbers is that they correspond to how long it takes someone to make up their mind. And so the numbers two, four, six, and eight refer to the number of contacts needed before a buyer can reach a decision. Uh, our number two buyer is very fast, dynamic, quick. They take really just one at most two contacts to make up their mind. And Joy, this is the person that a lot of times we are marketing to because they're what's called low hanging fruit. I'm sure you've heard that term, right? Unfortunately. And, yeah. And 
what's interesting statistically is that only 3% of the population is ready to buy at any given time. So folks, if you're only marketing to the person who's going to buy today, you're missing out on the 97% with whom you can develop a relationship and go on to have them as customers tomorrow. Yeah, I remember um, many times a boss of mine used the term low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, the concept of email marketing is that they've opted in. So they're low-hanging fruit. They're ready. But that is not always the case. They may be ready for the relationship. They may be ready to be nurtured. They're ready for you to tell them why or provide a little extra value. Why do I buy yours over this one? And that's the four, six, and eight, I, I gather. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the number four buyer uh, takes around two or three contacts to make up their mind. They are also fairly fast, but they need one more contact after the sale is made. Hence, if you add one to three, you get four. Uh, so most they need four contacts. This is the person who is purch purchasing you as a relationship. You see, they want to do business with friends and they want that connection heart to heart. They want to feel like you care about them. Uh, they're not that price sensitive because they'll pay a little more if they can help a friend. So uh, that's our number four buyer. Uh, our number six buyer takes around six or seven contacts. Now, I, you may know this statistics, uh, Joy, that 70% of sales are made after seven touch points. This means that this buyer is, quote, average because they don't make their minds up until around six or seven contacts. They are vetting you. Vetting means that they are asking their network of friends and colleagues and family who do you know? And is what do you know about this person? And how long have they been in business? And what does the Better Business Bureau say? And so forth. They are gathering social proof as to whether or not what you do is the right thing for them. They want to be safe and secure. And then finally, we have the number eight buyer. I think they started eight contacts. And if you put the eight on its side, it becomes infinity. And so this person takes forever to make up their mind. Um, they are very careful, very studious. Uh, they take a deep nosedive to understand what it is you're doing. So with email marketing, they're going to be asking you for ROI, return on investment, like how many emails do we need to do and what should be the statistics of open rates and all this kind of stuff before they will engage you. So two, four, six, and eight, notice that it not only by understanding someone's number, you understand how long it's going to take to make up their mind. Hence, you've got an idea in your sales funnel, mm -hmm. how, you know, how people are going to come out, but it also has a lot of implications for follow-up right? How often and what kind of follow-up are needed in order to connect with this person authentically? So how do you tell that you've got a four, six, uh, you know, two, four, six, or an eight? I mean, two is like, you're on the phone and they're like, yeah, I'll take 10. So two is two, you know, done. But um, how do you tell that a four is not actually an eight and that this conversation is not going to become one in nine million? Great question. And, and just to clarify, although we happen to be talking right now about buying and selling, these styles pertain to personality, period. Right. Okay. They're okay. not just about, yeah, they're communication styles, right? Exactly. And so, you know, there, there are friends who are quick and speedo and, you know, they're, they've got the Bluetooth in the ear and they're typing and driving and they're doing a hundred things at once, right? Um, yeah, that's our number two. They're, they're action takers, go getters. They're very competitive and so forth. So, you know, the, we're talking about personality styles here. And so how do you tell what someone's style is? There are actually six different ways that I teach my clients to figure this out. And it takes, by the way, less than a minute mm -hmm. to know someone's style. Um, you can look at how they're dressed. 
that their clothing choices, the colors, the um, the actual fabrics that they're wearing, the uh, do they show a lot of skin? I mean, there's there's so much I could tell you about how people dress, and and that that's very revealing. Their vocal qualities, because maybe, like you said, Joy, they called you up in the phone and they're like, quick, 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 they want something done. Or, or maybe not so quick, they have questions to ask. Their vocal qualities are a clue. That number eight buyer is slow and low, very thoughtful, lots of pauses. They're looking for the right word to say. So again, you can tell that's a different focal quality than our fast go getter who wants it done and please do it now. Very different. So vocal qualities is the second way. Uh, the third is behavior. And here's a cute little one that you can use, you know, with any of your friends or, or colleagues for that matter. When did they come to the meeting? When did they come to the appointment? When did they come to the date that you've set? Do they come early? Well, that's a certain behavior of the number six. They always come early. Uh, do they come on time? Well, the person, the number eight tries to come on time. The number four and the number two come late. Now, the number four comes late with an excuse. Their excuse is, I was helping somebody. You know, there was something else going on. They love people so much, they don't know how to say goodbye and go on to the next activity. And the number two comes late without an excuse. They just walk in ready to go because nothing happens until I show up. Okay, so very different behavioral styles, right? Um, and then, so that's a third way is behavior. The fourth that I'm going to share with you is writing style. And you see that again in text messages and emails, uh, how people write. Do they write long stories? Do they, are they very curt? Do they write in bullet points? Do they have full paragraphs and complete sentences? Again, these are characteristics of the different styles. And, and the last one I'll go over that I love, it's really kind of a, a compilation of what we've been talking about, is social media. Go to social media. You're going to see somebody's picture, somebody's post, their word. Maybe it's a LinkedIn profile where there's an about section, uh, or maybe they've given recommendations. You're going to capture how this person thinks, what they value, what the words are that they use, and hence you're going to know their style. So um, those are just some of the ways you can figure out someone's style. And again, when you know the secret decoder ring, uh, you're going to be able to figure this out in less than a minute. You know, it, it's interesting, and I'm laughing a lot of the things because it, it is pretty interesting. But, you know, one of the things that I have a, a an acute problem with is when I get passionate or interested or engaged, and, you know, it becomes all about me. I'm I'm in the moment, and um, I, I might not be listening. Um, it's sort of a habit that I have at this point. And um, do you have a way for a person to be able to say to themselves, whoa, Nelly, you know, and, and literally stop the effervescence and turn it over to the next person? Because it, it's important um, for somebody who isn't selling to, th to um, oversell, you know. Uh, because they're they're trying to do their best. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, I get caught up in the moment, like right now. So, but, you know, what people do? How do they how do they hold themselves back in the moment, whether they're negotiating something very important or just trying to convince their husband of a restaurant they like to go to? You know, what's the what is uh, what is the psychology behind this? Twofold answer for you. One, know your style mm -hmm. because uh, certain styles are interrupters. Know your style. And then secondly, read the other person's style um, because certain styles hate to be interrupted. 
So if you're talking to a style that is adamant about not being interrupted, then by golly, this is a good time to say, whoa, Nelly, and hold back, right? Uh, earlier today, I was talking with such a person, and I did know that he was a strong number six style. The number six style does not interrupt and does not like to be interrupted. And um, however, there was a friendliness to him, which had a little bit of the four quality. Hence, I started to be the four person that I am. By the way, we have all four styles within us, just in a different order and a different amount. Mm -hmm. uh, so this particular five, uh, right at the beginning of our conversation, he then said, uh, excuse me, let me finish. And that was my cue for Nancy, zip the lips. Make sure that from going forward, you do not interrupt this fellow at all, because he was very strong in his correction that I had interrupted him. Now, by the way, I said there were two styles that interrupt. Number twos and number fours are interrupters. I'm a number four, very strong number four style. Number four styles interrupt to connect with the other person. Remember I told you they want that relationship, they want to make the seller into a friend. Well, they wanna make you, whoever they're talking to, a bosom buddy. And so they interrupt, but they interrupt to share with you and connect with you how we're alike. Oh my gosh, Joy, that happened to me too, you really? And so their interruption is not, it, it's to con continue the conversation in the same direction. Number twos interrupt for a very different reason. They get the gist of it. They're in a hurry. They want to get things done. There's so many things to do. Life is calling. And so they interrupt to divert. They interrupt to go to another topic. They interrupt to finish your sentence. They interrupt to go on to another activity. Um, they interrupt for that reason. Now, I mentioned sixes, number six buyers. Number I call them buyers. They're, they're personality styles. Number six individuals, they don't interrupt. I told you they're very rigid, very particular. Uh, it's mannerly and courteous, uh, you know, conversation as we take turns. The number eight person doesn't interrupt in general unless, unless you stimulated their brain cells, mm -hmm. unless they say to themselves, oh, my God, what you just said is wrong, and it's my duty to put you right. They'll interrupt for that purpose. Or, again, they interrupt because they know, and they want to share their wisdom and knowledge. Other than that, they tend to be good listeners and not interrupt, uh, especially if they don't know what, what the subject is. Uh, they don't feel they have expertise. They will hold back and not interrupt. So, again, just that little bit of behavior helps you know to whom you're talking. Um, one of the problems that I have <laughs> is um, when I'm having a conversation with somebody who doesn't like to be interrupted <laughs> and I've got five thoughts going on in my head. By the time that person is finished, I have one thought. I have one thought and I'm like, I just had what? Uh, okay, that was really great. And, you know, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's gone. And I hate that. I hate that. So, so may I make a suggestion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My suggestion is you may need to have a notepad with you or something that you could quickly jot down. Exactly. Quickly jot down. Oh, I wanted to say this. And then I wanted to say that. And by the way, that's, that's pretty characteristic of the number eight style. They have lots of ideas. You know, they're, they're stimulated and triggered by what they're hearing. Hence, there's so many ways they can respond. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I'm a number eight. You're kind of a 2A combination. Two like I said, we have all four styles within us, just in a different amount and a different order. That does make sense because when I'm ready to buy, I just buy. Done. But do you do some research yes. ahead of time? Yes. There you go. See, see the, the eight. And this is what's interesting about the eight as a buying style. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't like pressure, and if, and they resist pressure tremendously. So if you're trying to sell to a number eight, let's say this is your your spouse or or friend, and you want to go to the movies, or you want to, and there's a particular movie you prefer, etc. And you're trying to sell the idea of that movie. Uh, if you pressure this person, they won't even go to the movies now. <laughs> 
Period. I mean, that's how stubborn they can be and how resistant they are to being pressured. Uh, the best thing is to ask some questions with the number eight to, to help them think it through. And if you're very good at questioning, your questions can guide them to what you want. Okay. Yes. So yeah, number eights do their homework ahead of time. But once they've come up with a, a conclusion, if folks, they're ready to go and they don't want any blocks because they've thought it through and this is makes good sense for them to do. This, this reminds me of um, how my mom eventually learned to deal with me. So my mom realized that if she said, go clean your room, that I wouldn't at all. Not So she would say, you know, go clean your room knowing tomorrow I would clean my room. Because I would think, you know what, she's right, it's a mess in here. <laughs> but yeah, eights not, can be moment, con not at that moment. Eights are, are, are contrarians, and that may be a word unfamiliar to some, some people, but a contrarian is somebody who can, they see multiple sides because they have big picture thinking. And so if you're presenting side A, they're going to tell you about B and C and D because, again, they see a, a fuller picture. And hence, um, they're, they, they, they get a reputation for, for taking a contrary point of view, but that's because they're good thinkers and they're thinking through all the options. I was very good at risk management. <laughs> very good at risk management. I wouldn't be surprised if you would be a good member of the debate team. What do you think? You know, the funny thing is, is that um, um, I can't think on a dime. So if ah. someone attacks me, I'm so in the moment of, what did they just say? How dare they? <laughs> I'm, I'm hurt. I can't come back with something. So I'm, you know, I never, um, I have never been um, successful in, ma in pulling my emotions out of it. Uh, something I'm working on. Believe so the not, number four yes. podcasts are part of that workout. Because I'm talking to lots of people, with lots of opinions. And at any point in time, someone can say something that will just like throw me for a loop. And I'm purposely putting myself in that. To, you know, to say, well, you but, know, that wasn't so bad. You could do that again. Just keep practicing. So what were you going to say? Yeah, th thanks for revealing that, uh, you know, because I, I wanted to share that the, the people who um, feel uncomfortable when and feel personally, they take things personally, that's our number four style. So clearly you have a, a high number four style. It may not be your highest in terms of decision making, but there it is. And it comes to the forefront uh, during those occasions. Number four, people do take things personally. They also had replays long before the National Football League ever invented the replay mechanism because they will uh, review and go over what was said and I said, he said, she said, I could do it differently and so forth. So uh, this is the person who does a lot of self-reflection. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on every single night in bed. What did she say? What, what, what happened at that moment? I can't believe that happened. Wait a minute. I shouldn't apologize. She should apologize. It, it's, um, it, it happens all the time. But I, um, as I said, I'm trying to take the emotion out of it, make it a little bit more practical. And when I'm thinking to myself, that was just an emotional moment, then leave it be because we all do and say things emotionally. Sometimes you need to apologize. Sometimes you do. I'm sorry that I was angry. I'm sorry that I, you know, whatever. If I cried and I upset you in the moment as well, I hope that you understand, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, emotions, emotions are the worst and the best. <laughs> Yep, that's what makes us human. We have emotions. And, you know, um, one of the things that I did not introduce about myself during the initial uh, phase of our conversation is that I'm very spiritually based. I'm a student of A Course in Miracles, Law of Attraction, um, you know, other kinds of things like that. And so um, emotions can be our guiding system. And I think that's what law of uh, attraction suggests is that, you know, this is your personal guiding system and they can help you realize what you've been thinking. And if you don't like how you're feeling, now you need to take a look and change your thoughts. Right. Exactly. And that's how I look at it. 
uh, uh, one of um, uh, the points I've been having a discussion with uh, other people is uh, about um, envy because that's like something I have and I know I have it. And when I'm, you know, looking at a picture of a family and on their on vacation and it's a beautiful place, the first reaction I have is envy. Before I'm, I, I'm not even going, oh, isn't that lovely? I'm going, oh, isn't that lovely? And I, and I think to myself, why do you do that? And I do that because I do that. It is a reaction to something I want and haven't been able to obtain. So here's what law of attraction would suggest mm -hmm. uh, that every time you go, oh, I you know how lovely that is with a kind <laughs> of negative, you know, uh, cast on it, you are actually attracting more of what you don't have. And so the law of attraction would be that maybe, maybe you need to change again, you, change your thinking. I mean, they're, they're very deliberate in, that, in suggesting that our thoughts are what's producing our reality. And if you don't like the life that's going on right now, it's because of past thinking. So shift your thinking, do it deliberately. Uh, there's some suggestions about how to do that. Uh, many of these books give you ideas about how to change your, your thinking, because that is what will help you get what it is that you, quote, lack. Because as soon as you focus on lack in any way, you attract more like lack to you. Right, exactly. Well, the point is that you're really just feeding into a negative situation. And it will, um, like a vacuum, like suck all that negativeness keep sucking it over to you. Where, you know, now you're instantly thinking negative thoughts about everything. And you're wondering, well, where's that coming from? Because you're feeding into it. You know, I, 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 I call, um, I call it like, you know, like the biblical snake. The snake is poisonous, and if you let that poison into you, you you slowly die. You just slowly die. So you've got to say to yourself, okay, the snake is there to warn me about something. What is it? Okay, it's that I want something. What is it that you want? Okay, you, you know, you'd like to have the beautiful family on the beautiful yacht, you know, in the Mediterranean, underneath the beautiful sun, off the coast of some beautiful place. Okay, you want that. Okay. Isn't that lovely that they have that? Yes. The end. And, you know, I'm tra training myself. It's not easy. I, there's obviously a lot of things that I want. And that's really what... I'm learning. It's like, you know, I, I want a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Stop holding a grudge on people who've got those things. That's all. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not, that's your problem. That's not, you know, and, and fix it. So as we were talking, emotions are a beacon into yourself. That's and right. When you're feeling something, if it's anger, like like when people trigger an anger response, I used to do that to my husband all the time, and he used to do it to me. You know, we used to call it, you know, the expression "pressing your button." Mm -hmm. When um, this this happens, and there are many people that do this, you know, the uh, time when somebody's looking for an argument, they want an argument, they don't care. That's you know, they're looking for one, so they're going to hit every button they can to get you into their negative space. I personally, uh, I used to do a speaking a training in, in, in the workplace, you know, lunch and learn type of training. And uh, I talked about how to succeed with difficult people uh, because there are difficult people all around us. And by the way, difficult people are anyone who's not your style. Okay, anyone who's a different style is a difficult pe person. Now, some of them are more difficult than others, but uh, you know, difficult people usually don't share our style. And often they may be, I 
I'm going to use the word opposite, that their strengths and their values and the way they operate may be opposite the way you you do. However, diversity is really the spice of life. We need that diversity, uh, you know. And so when you're one of the ways to succeed with difficult people, I use this analogy, is to be that Toreador. You know how the Toreador stands in the bull ring with that, right, with the red cape. And uh, the red, by the way, is a color that apparently incites bulls to charge. Uh, you know, and for many of us, seeing red, you, you, that's an expression, right, or hot red under the collar. These are all, you know, kind of similar. So they, they, they hold that cape. But as the bull comes towards the cape, the bullfighter doesn't stand behind the cape because he, she would get gored, right? They get pummeled by the horns of the bull. They hold the cape in place and step to the side, letting the energy of the bull pass through the cape. Olé! Well, the, yeah, olé, as the crowd cries. Well, we need to do that with the difficult people in our life, is simply to see the energy. You know, they want to fight. They want to, they want to be contrary, whatever. And to just see that as energy that we can just step aside and it can pass on by. We don't have to block it, it receive it, take it into our hearts, be gored by it, you know, none of that. We can just step aside. Yeah, um, I, 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 I used to, my husband was like that. May he rest in peace. Um, he, he, when he had a bad day, he wanted an argument. And he would um, hit the buttons and I would laugh. Not purposefully, but because over time I began to realize he was hitting the buttons. And I was like, okay. He's going to start with my mother. And he would say, oh, you know, you're acting just like your mother. And I would go, here we go. Or sometimes he would, you know, he would do my dad. Oh, that's something your father would do. And if he really wanted to get me, he would say, oh, you're just like your sister. And <laughs> that would get me. And for a long time, that got me. And once I realized what he was doing, then I started to laugh. And I was like, okay, that's not the right response either. I learned, you know what? I'm going to take the dogs for a walk, sweetheart. I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> that was the only thing I could do. Good, good plan. Yeah. I, I often counsel uh, friends around this, uh, and I will suggest to them to be an anthropologist, to be a scientist, and to simply watch people's behavior like what you did with your husband and see it can be very repetitive. It, it goes in the same form all the time. And when you're not there to uh, parlay back, and to play the other role, it stops, right? You can't, there's nothing that's going to happen. It's like, does the force make a, um, you know, a, uh, a noise when a tree falls and no one's there to hear it? If you're gone, it's gone, right? So anyway, that's one of the things, you know, if you're having trouble with somebody in your life because stylistically they're different than yours, uh, take a walk with the dog or alternatively, you know, just, you know, observe it, be a scientist. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to dance. Yeah, exactly. And um, it, I proved it because when I would come back from the walk, pleasant as pie. Moment would be yep. over. Yep. 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 Like, yep. Oh, what's for dinner? <laughs> oh, let's do this. Oh, watch this TV show. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Yeah, the energy just passed on by and... You didn't have to be the collector and receiver of the, that energy. Very often, um, something, you know, would trigger that for him. And it was usually my um, anticipation of him coming home from work. I always greeted him. So he would be, oh, my God, what does she want from me? Because he was obviously in thought, you know, deep in thought. And me coming at him, even though I was so excited to see him, he would look at it as, oh, somebody else wants something from me. Or, you know, I, I need to have another conversation, <laughs> whatever. Exactly. And I thought to myself, this poor guy, <laughs> if I don't say hello to him, he won't be happy. If I just say, hey, sweetheart, how you doing, baby? Come out and kiss him and walk away. Uh, you know, a lot of different solutions in life, especially when you're married. Marriage is very interesting. I would... Yeah. Recommended for everyone. It really teaches you <laughs> quite a lot, quite a lot. Yeah, more than I anything. remember. 
I have been married, and uh, I'm not currently married, only had one marriage. And I remember a good friend of mine at the time of the divorce, which at the, which felt really painful. It felt like the worst thing that could have happened because I had seen myself as married, having children, being the president of the PTA and all that sort of thing. Well, and she said, you know, you don't ever have to do that again. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> When, you know, it's like I had the experience and uh, I can go on to other experiences. When my husband, um, he was sick and when he was getting more sick, he, you know, he said to me, I want you to remarry. And I looked at him, I'm like, no way. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. <laughs> um, <laughs> once was enough. <laughs> once was enough. I mean, I was married with him 25 years and I lived with him for 27 and I knew him for 30. So, you know, I, okay, sweetheart, I, you know, I will um, fondly remember you and talk with, talk of you fondly, but no, I don't think I want to get married again. <laughs> and, you know, it goes, the thought comes into my head now and again, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> it's a whole different conversation. You know, I, um, I've, I've had, so many um, conflicts in life. Um, some of them repeat, and some of them, like it's almost like, oh, here we go again, literally in my head, oh God, I met this person before. Sometimes it's with the same person, sometimes it's with a totally different person. And um, I, you tell me if I'm wrong, I've come to the um, conclusion that these people exist, you're going to meet them again and again. They're not your best friends. You're not going to be able to sell to them. Say hello, say goodbye, be pleasant, and move on. Is that defeatist or is that realistic? Do you have to sell everybody? Is that what is in your head? No, as a matter of fact, Joy, one of the things that I counsel my clients is when you know your style and you know the uh, ideal, the style of your ideal client. Um, and usually of the four styles, it, it's one or two that you really uh, feel comfortable with and, and, and a good connection. Find someone who does what you do, who likes the other two styles. And then guess what? You could be referring to each other. So I don't necessarily believe that you should be able to sell everybody or that you even want to sell everybody, nor will you be happy selling everybody. I am sure that especially people who've started off as an entrepreneur know that you initially will take anybody who will pay your fee and sometimes do it for free, right? Because you're gaining experience and you realize pretty quickly, I didn't like working with that person. It wasn't fun. And after all, isn't that why we're here is to have fun with our businesses. It's it's not a drudgery. It shouldn't be a drudgery. Yeah, and I think that um, learning how to say no professionally, um, because even though you're of different styles, let's say you don't click, but if you end the relationship in a in a professional way, they may they may eventually they may refer you. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, they may not be your work buddy, your best client, but they may be, oddly, they may be an ally. I haven't been able to, um, haven't been able to do that, <laughs> it's, but I, I have, and, you know, it occurred to me at least 10 years ago, burning bridges is a very bad thing. Um, you may feel, I feel better when I'm going to say this, so I'm just going to say this, and you just say what you have to say, and you conclude the relationship, and the bridge is burned. Um, you don't feel better after you say it. Um, you don't have an ally. You may have just ditched 10 years of your life, and um, you need to learn from that experience, and I, I would... Um, I would suggest that people recognize a relationship that's not going to work and to instead turn it into a professional um, goodbye. Learn how to do that. Learn how to do that immediately. You're talking with somebody on the phone. Uh, you're trying to close the deal. You're almost there. And then you get that whiff. 
oh, wait a minute. Even if I get this person, this is going to be work in hell. Why, why do I even want this job? I don't want this job. <laughs> so, you know, what, Molly? Dog stalking. So, um, you know, you've got to... Um, You've got to recognize it. You've got to see the pattern, recognize it, and gracefully, graciously deal with it. Learn, learn a way to deal with it. Um, that's my biggest mantra to myself. Um, recently had a working relationship. I should have recognized it from the beginning. Um, they didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. Although they hired me as an email marketer, everything I said, they were like, oh, okay, well, I didn't understand that. And I'm like, well, didn't you hire somebody to do it? Why are you trying to understand that? You're supposed to be feeding, you know, feeding your voice, your brand into me. Stop telling me that you don't understand what I'm doing. That's why you hired me, right? Let's, let's understand the brand. And, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't flowing. They didn't get the relationship. Um, and they eventually hired a marketer. And I was like, okay, so now what am I supposed to do with this marketer? And that marketer further grilled me. I was like, this needed to end two weeks ago. What, why are they dragging this out? I don't know what they're trying to do here. Were they like they didn't know how to fire me? I was like, so eventually I um, made it easy. And I just said, you know, this, this probably can end at this point, you know, you've got a marketing person, like, well, you know, I feel pretty confident in X doing it. Oh, okay. And it was done. I was like, oh, ooh, <laughs> thank you very much. But it happens. It, does, it, it absolutely happens, you know, as an entrepreneur, but it also happens. It also happens to people who get into relationships, employee, employer relationships. Now I had a job where every day, for a year, I'd go to work and I'd say, what in the world am I doing here? Is this the very antithesis of me or what? Oh, and I would say, just do work, just, just get busy. And I'd get busy, but every morning I would say that. And it ended up, I ended up getting let go because I was the complete opposite of what they wanted. And there was a time when I was in my boss's office and she said, you either do it my way, or, and she literally said, or the highway. You're either on my team or you're off my team. And I thought to myself, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and in a week, I was let go. And, um, you know, it's, it, those, uh, those relationships may be, oh, that was the worst time of my life. But no, let's. Let's replay, like you said, let's do that replay and think about what happened and use it. Because again, you recognize the personality. Just because the job is offering you that much money, is it really worth that much grief? What kind of a relationship is it? Are, are you going to be spending every single day in hell just to make that six figures? Is, is it worth it? Clearly, the answer is no, but then we each have different values and priorities. Yes. And, of course, someone who's got family to support uh, it may find that they stay in a situation longer than they feel comfortable because, uh, again, they, they're taking responsibility for the choice they made and the necessity for bringing in money to support the family. The very definition of fortitude. Mm -hmm. But um, many people are doing that. Many people are doing that every single day and they do well. And um, it's called, also called the very definition of compartment, compartmentalization, where they just pack it up at the at five o'clock and they just come home and, you know, they do what they do. Um, I think that uh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I know I can't do that. I can't, I can't turn it off. Not when I really feel that, uh, um, my skills are being abused. I can't turn it off, but that's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, 
Are there any last words that you could share with uh, my audience that you think they can take away and, um, you know, use um, quickly or, or, you know, use for um, the good? So I want to go back to, to the idea of style because we've basically been talking a lot about different styles. And uh, we each have a style. It may, it's made up of these four different uh, personality types, just in a different amount and different order. Each style has certain values attached to it. When, you know, values are valuable, uh, it's just that we may not value the same thing. And so when you are in an uh, interaction, whether with a boss or a loved one, a family member, or perhaps a you know, colleague, or maybe it is a sales situation, when you're in a, a, that kind of interaction and it's uncomfortable, there's a good chance that it's a stylistic difference. So again, when you understand your own style, know what your style is, and you read the other person's style, you'll see that there's a good chance the person's not doing anything to you. They're just being true to their style. Uh, that gentleman that, er, that I mentioned earlier who was reprimanding me, I mean, he didn't uh, reprimand maybe too strong a word, but, you know, he, he claimed his territory. He wanted to speak his speak. And uh, that it, I, it wasn't personal. It wasn't like he was attacking me. Uh, it, it, that's what his values are fairness. I have a turn, then you have a turn. And I had stepped on his turn. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yep, I, I get you and it's not personal. And now I just backed off. And like I said, the rest of the conversation went beautifully, smoothly. In fact, there was one point he even interrupted me, which I found fascinating. I let him do that because uh, that's my style is to have a kind of give and take and back and forth without, quote, taking turns. Mm -hmm. Good for you. So it's not personal. If I can leave that with uh, the listeners, don't take things personally. It's just style mm -hmm. um all that stuff all this good stuff are in the books that people can see right behind yes. you yes with uh, the book uh compelling selling uh which uh again they're both on amazon uh gives you a list of words associated with the four different buying styles so again people who are in the marketing field or uh you know write their own copy or whatever uh these words are great if you're uh, speaking to folks or writing, et cetera, to put those words in because they will definitely attract and resonate with your buyer uh, or your audience. And the other book, No Pressure Selling, again, goes over the four personality styles and talks about how you can uh, ask for permission and therefore not be pushy, aggressive, or salesy. Uh, talk naturally without a script so that you come across as a human being and conversational and adjust what you say to match the style of your prospect. So I, I, I highly recommend those books. I have others as well. I'm going to buy them. But I'm going to buy them for my, I'm going to buy them in digital. They're they are available in digital? Yeah, they're available in digital. Uh, and uh, I've actually recorded them for audiobooks. Uh, for whatever reason, Audible is being very slow. So I can't refer people yet to the audio version. Okay, well, well, we'll wait for those. But I'll definitely pick one up at the Amazon Kindle store. Well, I there really you go. appreciate it. I thank you so much, Nancy. This has been great. Is there um, like... Uh, Maybe you want to share your LinkedIn pro, your LinkedIn URL or something that you can you know share with people to find you on the sure. internet. Very easy because uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, I go by Nancy Zare without any uh, period or hyphen or or you know it's just Nancy Zare. Zare rhymes with care. <laughs> so uh, in case you're wondering how to pronounce it, uh, and so the LinkedIn and Facebook are both that way and. Uh, Yes, I look forward to people connecting. And if you, by the way, would like to have autographed copies of print books as opposed to the digital version, uh, you can go to Nancy Books with a plural books dot link. Uh, so that's the URL to get autographed copies of my books. Oh, very nice. Thanks so much. Well, have a wonderful Friday. Again, thanks so much for being with me. And it was a pleasure. 
<laughs> to your sales success. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Take care now.